associated with the nutritional physiology group in the Department of Animal Science. And the topic that I'm going to talk about today uh, has uh, to do with uh, nutrition and development. Uh, the title uh, that uh, I gave this uh, particular talk uh, I gave uh, because of the resemblance of uh, what I'll talk about uh, to a shag rug. Uh, of course, the shag rug that, that most of you know about uh, are widely used as, as floor coverings. Uh, they're relatively recent vintage. and uh, But the one that I will address myself to today is uh, one that's been in existence for a long, long time. And in fact, uh, it's been rather crudely described as early as the early 1800s. Uh, the one that I'm going to talk about uh, adorns the walls and the home of millions of bacteria and protozoa. And uh, it is one that lines one of the stomach compartments of such animals as cows, sheep, goats, and other ruminants. Its uh, development and color and length of, of the shag can be changed by changing the diet, and it needs frequent cleaning or serious problems may result. So uh, with that as an introduction, uh, I'll go through a series of slides and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, development of the shag drug, at least the one that I'm going to talk about, and uh, some influences upon it. On the, on the screen here, we have a schematic uh, of the ruminant stomach as well as some related organs. This very large compartment here which takes in most of the left side in the animal it is called the rumen and it's the second compartment of the stomach. The reticulum which is a smaller compartment up here is the first compartment. From there we go into uh, the old mason, the abomasum. It actually is only one stomach, but with four different compartments. And these are separated by, by various pillars or sphincters or uh, openings of one type or another. Uh, this is a, a model uh, of the stomach from the left side. And as you see, the, the rumen occupies uh, this entire space. Uh, it's divided into various compartments here by different uh, types of pillars or muscular uh, uh, structures, which we'll uh, point out in just a minute. Uh, this is a, a view of it from the right side, uh, again showing the, the omasum and the abomasum. Now this is a cross section through the second compartment or the rumen. And as you can see, it has a very rough looking uh, interior. It's uh, separated by these various pillars, which I mentioned a minute ago, this being the posterior part. And you see two smaller compartments here, which is the uh, posterior uh, dorsal and ventral, uh, called the posterior dorsal and ventral rumen. But this entire structure, other than just for these muscular pillars, is covered by this shaggy lining. This is a frontal view uh, which shows the reticulum. Now, the reticulum is sometimes called a honeycomb, and I think you can see why it is, because of the pe peculiar internal lining which is divided up in little uh, compartments which uh, looks something like a honeycomb. Uh, this is a cross section of the omasum and the abomasum. The omasum is sometimes called the mini flies, and it, it has a great 
number of leaves uh, in its internal structure. Uh, all of these are covered again by this uh, kind of shaggy looking uh, material. Uh, it apparently is, is primarily in the circuit here uh, as a filter to prevent coarse material from going on down uh, into the atomasum because the atomasum has a, a, a mucosal lining which is very delicate and is subject to injury if you did get uh, excessively rough material down in there. It also has been refuted that the, the omasum, uh, the surface area of the leaves of the omasum is something on the order of about a hundred times the, the body surface area of the animal. So it also acts as a, as a organ of absorption uh, and uh, performs these two functions. The avomasum is quite similar uh, to, to the stomach that, that you and I have and, and performs many of the same uh, functions. One other structure that I might mention uh, in the ruminant, which uh, has some significance, particularly in the young animal, and that is this structure right here, which is called the esophageal or reticular groove. And it goes from where the esophagus comes into uh, the stomach and goes right on by this into uh, the third compartment or the omasum. Uh, when an animal suckles uh, milk, the, the lips of this particular groove close and it forms a conduit that goes directly from the esophagus uh, and bypasses the first two compartments so that none of the milk or none of the liquid uh, that is consumed uh, goes into those first two compartments. The reflex that controls this is active as long as the animal suckles and there are some particular types of solutions that will cause this reflex to be effective even in older animals. But as soon, generally as soon as the uh, young no longer suckles then uh, this particular groove becomes more or less inactive unless it's stimulated in some uh, fashion. Now, here's an example of the shag. This is the internal lining of, of the rumen, and this is what we'll address ourselves to uh, for the most part the remainder of the time. Uh, this shag can appear in, uh, anywhere, if the shape of, of the uh, of the uh, papillae, as we call them, may vary all the way from kind of a paddle shape uh, to a finger-like appearance. You get lots of different colors depending upon the way the feed is processed. Uh, this, is, this structure is quite similar to the skin, uh, to, to your skin, except on skin these projections go in toward the in toward the internal part of the arm, whereas uh, the lining, of course, the projections go to the outside. Otherwise, the structure is quite similar. But you see all different sorts. Uh, you, you see uh, various densities in which you have, have uh, these very closely packed together. They, they come in various lengths. They come in various colors. And they depend in great uh, order upon the type of diet that is fed. Now, let's talk about how, the, how this develops. We, over a period of years, have been quite interested in this because in feeding uh, young animals, we're interested in feeding a minimum amount of milk and developing the rumen as rapidly as possible so that they can adequately handle dry feed. This is quite dependent upon how rapid uh, this internal lining uh, and capacity of the rumen develops. And this happens to be a picture of a newborn calf uh, that is less than a day old. And as you can see here, the rumen occupies only a very little area here, right up here in the front of the abdominal uh, cavity. Uh, most of this is taken up with the avalasum. And if you, if you consider the relative capacity of the rumen 
uh, to the rest of the stomach, why the rumen only constitutes something on the order of about 30% of the stomach capacity, total stomach capacity. Now, if you maintain this cap only on milk for varying periods of time, you still get some uh, expansion in rumen size. This happens to be a cap of four weeks of age, and as you can see, the rumen has become somewhat larger here. Uh, it now constitutes about 50% of the total stomach capacity, uh, even though it, it has received no dry feed at all, only milk, and the milk bypasses the rumen. So what essentially uh, is in the rumen is, is any water that the animal consumes. But not, not a great deal of development. This is what the internal lining of the stomach looks like. It's always a rather pink in color. Uh, you do not have very much in the way of papillae on here at all. It's quite smooth. But the numbers of papillae, uh, they're there all right, but just have not developed because if you say take the number per square centimeter, uh, this will range somewhere on the order of about a thousand papillae per square centimeter of area. But they're very short. They're, they're less than a half of millimeter in height. Now if you go to uh, eight weeks, then you get still further development. And by this time, why the rumen constitutes something on the order of about 65 or 70 percent of stomach capacity. But as you'll see, very little in the way of papillary development. It's about the same as before. Uh, the only difference is that the number of papillae per square centimeter have decreased again, indicating some stretching. In other words, it appears that the number of papillae uh, that are, are on the rumen wall uh, are there from, from birth and that there are no additional ones uh, grow over a period of time. They only begin to stretch out and so you get fewer per square centimeter. Then at 12 weeks, of course, you still get a little bit more of rumen expansion here, but still uh, not as much as you'll see in some of the subsequent uh, slides. And again, no change as far as papillary development is concerned. Now let's drop back to an animal that's gotten hay and grain in addition to milk. Immediately you can see that the rumen has increased quite markedly, even at four weeks of age. And by the time it, it is this age, why it's already assumed about 60% of total stomach capacity. And the papillae have begun to develop. And by this time, there's something on the order of uh, a little over a millimeter in height. And the numbers have dropped down to about 500 per square centimeter. By eight weeks of age, uh, the rumen has pushed all of the intestinal tract over to the right side now. It's, it's undergone that much expansion. And uh, it has already assumed almost adult proportions, which is something on the order of about 75 or 80 percent of total stomach capacity. The same with the papillae. The papillae now have uh, extended to, to uh, almost two millimeters in height uh, and have taken on a typical color that is, is found uh, where dry feed is fed. Uh, the numbers have uh, continued to decline down to about uh, 250 uh, per square centimeter. Now, at 12 weeks of age, uh, the rumen is quite large and is assumed adult proportions. And the papillae have all also uh, gotten to a point that they are quite similar to what you'll find uh, in the adult. Uh, most of them will be uh, on the order of uh, three to three and a half millimeters long. Uh, the numbers are down around 100 to 150 per square uh, centimeter. And again, you have this typical color. Now this is a this is a different sort of a, a 
calf here. This is one that uh, since, since uh, these papillae apparently develop in response to dry feed, there are two aspects that we wanted to look at. One was that uh, the musculature changed. In other words, if, if the animal consumes dry feed, uh, the rumen wall also contains more muscle. Uh, and as well, uh, you have this papillary development. Well, this animal we fed plastic sponges to, uh, something that was indigestible, in which you'd have no end products of digestion in the rumen, but nonetheless would provide bulk. And as you can see, uh, even at eight weeks of age, which this animal was, that the capacity of this rumen is much larger than those on hand grain, even at 12 weeks of age. But look at the internal lining. No papillae. So dry feed is definitely necessary, or some bulk is definitely necessary for muscular d development, but you need end products of digestion for the development of the papillae. Now this is another one which was, a, it was an experimental one, and this one we gave some of the end products of digestion, uh, put it directly into the rumen. This one was uh, one that we administered propionic acid to, which is one of, one of the major end products of digestion. And uh, as you see, you do get some papillary development, although you don't get the, the typical pigmentation that you get uh, with animals on dry feed. Uh, the papillae on this particular uh, animal were equally as good as those in a, in a hay grain animal at uh, an equivalent age. This is another one uh, in, that we gave butyric acid to, which is another of the end products of fermentation. And again, we got a similar sort of response as far as papillary development. The papillae developed, but the pigmentation, of course, was absent. Now this particular slide shows the influence of diets that are prepared in different ways. These all came from different animals which were maintained on the same diet but prepared quite differently. This one in this corner, for example, was uh, one in which the diet, all the grain and so on in the diet was maintained in, in its whole and original state, fed that way. Uh, this one was one in which uh, this particular, the grains in this particular <coughs> diet were cracked, but not very finely. As we go on over here, this is one in which they were, were more finely ground. This one is one in which they were very finely ground. Then coming back to this, this is one in which uh, the animal got in addition to uh, this grain, it got, got some hay. And these last two are uh, from animals in which this diet, uh, number five, the diet was ground and pelleted, and number six, the, the diet was ground and pelleted, and then reground again. So you get some very uh, different uh, looking papilla and development and pigmentation, even though the, the ingredients in the diet are the very same but prepared in different ways. Now, what is the significance of all of this? Well, this is a histological slide that, that is a cross-section of one of the papillae uh, from a, a calf that received only milk. And as you can see, this outer layer uh, contains very cornified uh, material. It's quite thick uh, in appearance and the internal connective tissue here is very dense uh, with little evidence of very much in the way of blood and lymph vessels. This would suggest that this particular uh, uh, section would not be very uh, capable of absorbing anything. This is one from one that's uh, a hay grain animal and as you can see, this has become thinner in appearance, you, you get various vacuolated cells uh, out here in the periphery, and then you see a, a preponderance of blood and lymph vessels in the internal connective tissue. 
which suggests certainly that uh, this particular tissue would be very capable of absorbing uh, nutrients from, from the rumen. So absorption uh, is one of the major functions uh, of, of the rumen and uh, as such uh, then uh, development of the papillae were, are quite interesting. Uh, so, uh, as a measure of this, we decided we'd do some absorption trials to see if there actually are differences that occur in the absorption uh, from the rumen uh, on, at different stages of development. So the next series of slides I'll show will be some of this particular aspect. Now we used calves that uh, started out about this age. This is one that's about four days old. And it's one in which we have put a small rumen fistula uh, in. This is just a small hole that uh, we put into the, to the rumen. It's permanent, uh, it does not hurt the animal uh, appreciably. And it uh, makes it such that we can empty out the rumen or we can put materials into the rumen, uh, sample from the rumen, and as a result, we can measure uh, what goes on. Sometimes we make mistakes when we do research. And this happens to be one of those. Uh, this, this is one that we were supposed to put the, uh, the fistula in the rumen and it so happened that we put it in the, in the abomasum or the true stomach. And as you can see, if the calf drinks milk, it runs right out the fistula. So uh, we do occasionally make a few mistakes. Uh, in our absorption studies, uh, there are several things that you need to do with uh, ruminants. Since they secrete saliva all the time, we had to eliminate uh, the saliva getting into the rumen. So we equipped the animal with a, a device uh, which we passed down through the nasal uh, passage uh, down into the esophagus. And there was a balloon right here which we blew up. Uh, there are holes here uh, in this tube uh, so that we could any saliva that's collected here in this area above the balloon, we can pull off through the, this center tube and, and out to the outside so that uh, it prevented dilution of rumen contents. Uh, we then uh, emptied the rumen, uh, washed it out, and then put into the rumen the various solutions that we uh, wanted to test to see whether absorption was taking place. Uh, the, the thing that we, we used was acetic acid or the same thing as, you, as uh, is in vinegar. And this is, uh, one, again, one of the principal end products of, of digestion. And so we measured its absorption from the rumen under uh, different stages of development. This happens to be a slide uh, of a calf that was only on milk. Uh, and as you can see from from uh, the difference between one and 13 weeks, that very little absorption uh, occurred in this animal, and it coincided with the papillary development. There was virtually uh, no papillary development over this period of time. Uh, this is a milk hay grain animal in which uh, papillary development did occur, and as you can see, the major the major change occurred between one week and four weeks of age. And in this particular calf, that's when the major change occurred in papillary development in this calf. This is another calf, uh, again, uh, on milk only, which shows a similar thing uh, to the previous one. And then another one uh, on milk hay and grain, which shows a different trend. And you see that the major change occurred between 8 and 13 weeks. And in this particular calf, that's when the major change in population occurred. So uh, e each individual animal will vary depending upon uh, how quickly uh, it begins to eat quantities of dry feed and how rapidly the papillae will develop. Uh, this particular slide uh, shows uh, some calves that were maintained for quite a long period of time on milk or milk, hay, and grain and in which absorption was followed. And in this milk, hay, grain animal, of course, the absorption uh, ran up here uh, fairly high. In the one that was maintained on milk only, uh, very little change, even out to about 30%. 
35 weeks of age. And then we had one which we maintained on milk out to about 19 weeks uh, and then changed it to milk, hay, and grain. And as you can see, as soon as it began to get to hay and grain, of course, the absorption began to increase as, and the papillary development uh, increased. This particular point I might uh, make mention of, and this is rather interesting, on, that, on the particular uh, evening before we did that trial, the rumen plug came out and he lost all of his contents. And we later found that it is essential for the contents to be in the rumen or to have end products of digestion present uh, all the time or you do get a decrease in absorptive uh, ability of this rumen papillae. And uh, it apparently is because the rumen papillae do metabolize these end products of digestion. And when uh, the end products are absent, of course, why then they, they get to a very low metabolic state and as a result, absorption is decreased. So this is what we feel accounts for this very low point out there at this particular time. Uh, since then, why we have had other instances uh, which confirm that this actually is the case, that you must have these volatile fatty acids present all the time for absorption to uh, occur uh, very well. This final slide, I'll uh, just conclude uh, my remarks here. Uh, I mentioned that you must uh, kind of keep this clean and, and under usual circumstances, uh, the higher uh, amount of end products present in the rumen, why of course the faster is the metabolism and the faster will be the cornification of the surface layers of the uh, papillae. And if you do not have something in the rumen that will scrub this off, why these layers begin to accumulate and you get uh, what we call a hyperkeratinization. And sometimes too, these uh, various papillae will begin to uh, clump together as a result of this. And they also get feed particles that become trapped in this. And eventually uh, it becomes more fragile and sometimes becomes necrotic or the, the cells begin to die. So, if you don't have something in the rumen, such as a roughage or coarser material, to kind of keep this scrubbed off, uh, while you do get a dirty shag rug, and it can lead uh, eventually to some problems. So in closing, I would say that uh, if you want your shag rug to remain functional, while you want to uh, supply it nutritionally, and also keep it clean. Thank you. Can I entertain questions from anyone? I have one. Is this an enzyme induction process where, you know, you, know, you mentioned that the aquatic animal lost its contents and then it went back up? We have to keep something constantly there. I don't know whether it's an enzyme induction process or whether it's a matter of, of uh, changes in va vascularity or blood flow because uh, it's been demonstrated that, uh, that uh, volatile fatty acids will cause uh, dilation and increased blood flow. So it may be only this. Uh, since since the, the volatile acids are rather passively uh, diffused. I mean, uh, uh, at least as far as we know, it's not an active process. I would guess that it's more blood flow than anything else. But I, I, uh, I certainly wouldn't rule out that it's involved in, to some extent in, in some metabolic aspects.
Well, we've had calves that we've never fed any milk to. Uh, they look they look like the devil for the first few days, but uh, they have survived. But you must provide something that is uh, akin to milk uh, as a, a starter. Most of our calves, uh, I think you can get by pretty readily and do a pretty good job by by feeding only limited milk uh, for a three week period. Uh, usually by that time they're consuming enough dry feed that they can they can make it pretty well if the dry feed is quite palatable and is, is uh, a good concentrated source of nutrients. Uh, but it, it just depends upon on the calf. Uh, some will eat dry feed earlier than others and uh, we rather feel that limiting the amount of milk that you feed, of course, stimulates dry feed intake. Uh, they'll eat more. But you can, uh, you can get by uh, quite early, uh, just feeding milk for a very limited time. Yeah, now that you... Yeah, now you see uh, with veal feeding, you you, you feel you feed uh, high amounts of, of milk or, or uh, exclusively milk actually for a period of six weeks, and uh, you're you're pushing the calf along uh, to to make say a gain of something between three and four pounds gain a day, so you're feeding very large quantities. Uh, and since milk is, uh, one of the characteristics of veal is that it's quite light, or the good veal is uh, essentially almost colorless. Uh, uh, they even will grade down veal that has very much color to it, and this results from feeding milk, which is low in iron, and uh, does not, uh, in, in fact, calves, uh, veal, most veal calves are quite anemic, and this is essentially why the the co meat color is so light. Yeah, the aim is to have them, the aim is to start out with a with a hundred pound animal and have it to uh, 250 to 300 pounds in six weeks. And that takes, uh, that really takes speed. I have another uh, when does most of the absorption take place in the middle of the night? Are down in the crypts? Has this been really worked out? Well, I can only say this, uh, Mac, that if you, if you take the papillae and shave them off at various levels, if you take the epithelium, the whole epithelium, and incubate it uh, in a media, its activity is very much less than if you uh, shave the papillae off, say, about halfway down. It, it seems that as you go more toward the tip that the activity increases. You see. So I, I, I really don't know. Uh, I would guess that, that it pretty much occurs throughout uh, the papillae, but may be a little more active out toward the tip because uh, I rather suspect that more of the cornified tissue is scaled off out toward the tip and it is thinner. Well, this would be an agreement with what takes place in the head. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I can sit here and ask you questions all day. Go uh, ahead. Okay. Uh, as you know, in the simple stomach animal, you can uh, put a topical anesthetic on the surface epithelium, and then when you bring into contact with this epithelium, uh, some byproduct or degradated product, you'll get a response, say, of motility and as well as gastric. Uh, has this been demonstrated here in the room? I guess the, the, the real broad question, thing I'm trying to get to is, is this a humoral response or a neural response that's taking place here? Uh, 
I'd say it's not it's not neural uh, because you can you can uh, uh, say introduce a solution of uh, procaine in the rumen and pretty well deaden it all over. Uh, take this out and introduce uh, say a solution of fatty acid and you'll get a pretty pretty much the same response as far as absorption is concerned. Yeah. Yeah, this has been tried both in uh, just room and pouches as well as the whole yeah. room. Uh, what about the neural input to the room? Do you have practices there in the uh, wall? Like you say? Well, to some extent, but not as, ex as extensive. Uh, I think some of the British work has shown that, that uh, particularly up around the cardiac area, there are some. But I think they become more diffuse and, and uh, less extensive as you spread out toward the posterior part of the rumen. You don't really, uh, you know, if you stimulate various areas of the, of the rumen, you really don't get localized responses like you do if you do the intestine. I know that they've tried on various occasions to, to pro propagate, you know, unusual uh, waves of motility by stimulating uh, various areas in the rumen, and, and it, you, you just don't get any response. 